morning. This is going to be a service today where you um, will be responsible for your response. I think that's a good way to say it. Where God, I believe, will meet with you if you are willing to meet with him. Where you can be moved and changed if you are willing to allow yourself to be moved and changed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Today could be that day. And we're continuing our series on the parables, on the stories that Jesus told, kingdom stories, stories where he unfolded the truths of how things are supposed to be where Jesus Christ is in charge. And the story we're going to talk about today is a story that Jesus told that is right in the middle, sort of buried in the middle of an event that actually happened. So it's a little confusing because parables are stories that, stories that Jesus made up that he really made up, but they didn't really happen. Does that make sense? The story itself, Jesus really told, but the events that Jesus talked about in the parables didn't really happen. So this particular parable didn't really happen. Jesus really told it, but it is in the middle of a story that really happened that's really important. So I've made it really clear, haven't I? I'll try to explain it as we go. If I'm talking to you and you and I are having dinner together, as you'll see this setting is at a dinner party, and I'm trying to give you an, an analogy, trying to give you an illustration. I may just go into just sort of a tangential kind of an example in our conversation where I try to illustrate a point and it may or may not have actually really happened, but you get it because I'm trying to use storying to try to help, well, drive something home. Well, you'll see Jesus does exactly that. Now, in this particular story, you're going to see two people. And in every parable, you find yourself, you find God. And I think you also see the opportunity or responsibility to change. That in the story that surrounds this parable, you'll see two people. You'll see a very self-righteous person, a Pharisee, and you will see a broken person with a past filled with regret running to the feet of Jesus. Now, the person who hosts the party that um, provides the setting and the context for, for this really powerful event and this powerful parable was a Pharisee. And Pharisees, by the time Jesus had come on the scene, his, his life, his 33-year life, particularly his three-year ministry, his public ministry, Pharisees had messed up church to where it was almost unrecognizable. They were self-righteous, and Jesus was always very critical, appropriately critical, of people who were self-righteous. The Pharisees had made the standard by which they measured themselves and everyone else, and they had done it outside of Scripture. Some of you know how tall I am because we've stood next to each other. I am five foot nine and a half. But what if I told you I was six foot two? Would you believe me? Well, you may believe me from a distance because after all, it's difficult to tell, you know, unless you're close up, but you know how tall you are. And the closer you get to me, the more you would realize that I'm, I'm definitely not six foot two. And I could swear to you, I'm six foot two. And you could look at me as Dan does like this and say, you're not six foot two. You're barely five foot nine and a half. And, and the more convinced I am and the more dogmatic I am, you know, I might could get you questioning your own height. But the reality of it is that, that I'm still five foot nine and a half. But what if I gave you a tape measure that I had created and built myself to where when you put it, you know, along the side of my body and tried to determine my height, when it got to five foot nine and a half, it didn't say five, nine and a half. What would it say? Six foot two, because I created a standard to measure myself by. I've convinced myself something's true that's not true. And I'm trying to convince everyone else. Well, that's what the Pharisees did with the Bible, with scripture. They adjusted the standard and were trying to convince other people things were true that weren't true. And almost always the things they were focused on were things that were designed to make them look better than they actually were. So the Pharisees invited Jesus to a dinner party. Very common to invite the visiting preacher into a dinner party. The Pharisees wanted to make sure that when they debated Jesus about um, who he said he was, more importantly, to prove who he's not, they didn't want to just do it one-on-one. -on -one. They wanted to make sure that they had an audience because after all, they didn't want to waste their wisdom and their effort on just one person. They wanted to refute Jesus and his claims on being God. And they wanted everybody else who could hear to hear. So they had a party that they had invited some guests to. 
The invited guests would have been men only, dignitaries of the time, other Pharisees, other religious leaders. The women would not have been invited into the meal. They would have been expected to serve the meal. It wasn't right. It was just the custom of the day. The townspeople could have stood on the outside of the, of the home and listened through the windows. There were no glass and there's no glass on the windows. Sometimes they would open the doors up after dinner was over and the discussion or debate could be heard by people and they would glean information. But riffraff were not allowed on the premises. And they had all kinds of categories of riffraff. Now I say riffraff with endearment because I would consider myself of the riffraff variety as opposed to the Pharisee variety. And I hope you would too. But the riffraff weren't allowed. And they had a hierarchy of riffraff. And the lower you were in the hierarchy, the less you were allowed to be around good, decent Christian folks. The worst was a tax collector. We've talked about them. Right above the tax collector was a prostitute. And then a person who sells camels was above that. And I don't know why. I've never spent much time around a camel. They just had weird rules. They had made their own ruler, their own standard that they used to measure people's worth. And the people who didn't fit weren't invited. The people who fit were barely invited. And the setting was one of tension. The setting was one of debate. The setting was one that was common because one after the other after the other tried to prove that Jesus was not who he said that he was. So this particular Pharisee, Simon, threw a dinner party and he invited Jesus. Let's read this together. When one Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Feet are nasty. Your feet may not be nasty. Um, at the end of a long day, I don't think my feet smell like roses. Back in Jesus' day, nobody's feet did because they walked everywhere they went and they wore sandals. Now, feet today are different than feet back then. Now, you ladies, pedicures and men, you know, we try to keep everything clipped and at least make sure that they don't just get, Pastor Jared has a feet phobia, by the way. If you, he's not here today, but if you want to gross Jared out, just walk up, take your shoe off and just give him a little, uh, and he will actually skeeve out. It, it like turns the skin. So just do it for fun, just to see Jared be uncomfortable. But back then, feet weren't considered just, you know, something to, oh, you know, they're gross. They were like unclean. If you got too close to somebody's feet, well, you know, you'd have to go and do some ceremonial washing and things. It was a big deal. And you were supposed to wash people's feet when they came in. But the point is that when you reclined at a table, the table was in the center. They had couches that were spread out like wagon, like spokes in a wagon wheel. You would recline on the couch, your feet would be pointed away and you would eat. And when they ate, they would eat and take their time. Do we take our time when we eat anymore? No. You have friends though, sometimes when you go out to dinner, and you just hang out and you just talk and there's nothing else on the agenda except just to be there and be in the moment with them. You're not driving through, you're not eating in your car, you're not grabbing something real fast and jumping in front of the couch to watch Netflix. That's how it was back in Jesus' day. Dinner was a big deal and they didn't have Netflix or cars or fast food. And so they would have meals that would last hours and they loved it and they, they were in the moment, they were fully present. So Jesus was at the home of the Pharisee, which I think showed a lot of grace because Jesus knew this Pharisee was trying to trip him up, trying to trap him. And this is all part of the event that actually really happened. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. Now, a sinful life meant prostitute, almost certainly, which would have put her down at the very lowest level of riffraff in society. Even more complicated than that would be that some of these men who were at the party would almost certainly have known her in a professional capacity, but they're trying to live one life in one place and one life in another. So by her being there, it very likely freaked some people out who were self-righteous, trying to prove how spiritual they were by what they did and how they looked, but not was on what was on the inside. So just her showing up, even on the periphery when you saw her there, would have caused tension in the room. For those that thought maybe she was coming for them to expose them, to those who were scandalized that a woman would show up at this party, a sinful woman would show up at this party. And so in this moment, if you were watching a movie 
the music would change. Drama would build. Rising action. What's going to happen? Why didn't the bodyguards get her at the door? Who let her come in? She knows that Jesus is eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came in, and I believe she ran in, because if she had walked in, somebody would have stopped her. She came in with an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now, um, alabaster was a common perfume. In Jesus' day, women wore perfume. Women wear perfume in our day. Men wear cologne. But in Jesus' day, it was important because hygiene was, um, you know, they didn't have as the hygiene practices that we do today. So women wore perfume. History tells us that one man spent $40,000 a year during Jesus' day on perfume for his wife. Can you imagine somebody smelling that bad, so bad that they need $40,000 a year? I mean, you could divorce people for a lot of reasons, but if you had a spouse that stunk that bad, maybe that would have made the cut back then. I don't know. But they would wear perfume. Nice women would wear a little perfume. So if you got real close to them, it, they smell good. Women of um, you know, ill repute would wear a little more perfume. I was in the TJ Maxx not too long ago, and there was a guy over in the cologne section, which should tell you right away that you're not dealing with $40,000 cologne. He was an older guy, and I think his nose had stopped working. <laughs> and I'm watching him, as I like to do. I love watching people, because people both fascinate and confuse me. And he's taking one bottle after the other and just pss, 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 And six bottles, I counted. And he's smelling. And I don't think he could smell it but everybody else in the TJ Maxx could smell it. And I have kind of an allergy. When I get too close to too much, it's sort of, and as he walked through, he parted the, I mean, everybody just cleared out because they couldn't be around him. And it wasn't quite that bad with these women, but the more they wore, people could find them because they sort of identified by having a little too much on. It was a way that they advertised. It was expensive. You'll see that this woman had an alabaster jar. We know that this alabaster jar would have been worth about one year of wages for a normal person working a normal job. She ran into a party that she wasn't invited to. Can you imagine how much courage it took for her to enter that room, knowing that she would be scorned, that her presence would be frowned upon, not knowing how Jesus would respond? She came into the room, she stood behind Jesus and began to weep and her tears rained down on his feet. And as you see, nobody had washed Jesus' feet, even the most basic custom. So she lets down her hair and she dries Jesus' feet with her hair. Then she wiped them, kissed them and poured perfume on them emptied her alabaster jar in an act of worship. Friends, she had swallowed her pride. She had dealt with her fear. She was leaving her past behind because not only had she been outed now as a person who wanted to follow Christ, she now had become public and everybody knew who she was and what she was. She threw herself at the mercy of a man she hoped was God and would receive her, but didn't know for sure. And poured out her wealth as a sign of her love. Let down her hair, which was scandalous for a nice Christian woman of the day to do. She was all in. This sinful woman. Let's keep going. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were really a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is. Don't you hate it when people label people? To label somebody is to ignore them. And this self-righteous Pharisee had put her in a category and said, if Jesus was really a prophet, he would see and know what kind of person she is. What kind of person are you? <laughs> what kind of person am I? What kind of person, what category would I be put in by somebody so self-righteous that they made their own standard 
to measure their spiritual height. The dangerous thing is they could put any category on you want or they wanted and change the rules if they wanted because the rules only applied to them and they recreated them at their pleasure. And he was judging this woman. He was judging Jesus. And he said, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is and that she is a sinner. Now here in this story, I'm sitting with the woman because I'm comfortable being called a sinner, saved by grace through faith, nothing I did to deserve it or earn it. It's the free gift of God given to me by Jesus Christ. Salvation is not a gift given as a reward to the righteous. It's a gift given to those who are sinful and desperately need Jesus. And this self-righteous person judges Jesus because he received her and judges her for even being there, labeling her by her worst mistakes, by her past, by what she did for a living, wrapping her identity up with her choices, condemning her future, dismissing her soul, further separating himself as the religious expert of the day from the heart of Jesus who desperately loved people like this woman and like me. So the tension in the room, you could cut it with a knife. And Jesus loved the tension because it brought a poignant moment of teaching. And here comes the parable. Jesus answered him. Let's go back one screen. I'm sorry and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Here's the story Jesus made up to prove a true spiritual point. Let's move forward. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. 500 denarii was about a, a year and a half worth of wages. 50 was a month and a half. So the money lender forgave both of their debts. Now, which of them will love him more? Well, Simon, the Pharisee says, well, obviously the one who was forgiven more will love more because a year and a half's wages is a whole lot more than a month and a half. And Jesus says, you and I don't agree on anything else that we've talked about or seen tonight, but we agree about this. You're right. The problem was the Pharisee did not realize how much he'd been forgiven for. And in fact, didn't even think he needed to be forgiven for anything. The Pharisee believed that he was bringing something to Jesus and adding value to the kingdom by just being there and hanging out with him. The self-righteousness, the blindness, spiritually speaking. The willful ignorance or defiance to the truths that Jesus was teaching and demonstrating. It's just hard to imagine. But Jesus arrives at common ground and says, you have judged correctly. And then he continues. Then he turned toward the woman and he said, Simon, do you see this woman? Now let's stop here for just a second. Do you see this woman? What do you see when you see this woman? I want to get down here below the light so I can see you. When you see this woman, I think this question was so important. Because when you look at somebody, what do you see in them? Do you look at them just to put them in a category and to judge them, to label them, to trap them in their past, to identify them by their worst mistake, to never allow them to outlive the things that may still fill them with regret? Do you look at them to elevate yourself, to put yourself above, to feel more superior? Do you create your own ruler so that you always look taller or more spiritual? And when Jesus said, do you see this woman? He's asking if, do you see the person? Do you see the potential? Do you see what I see? Do you see who I will die for? And Simon didn't see because he couldn't see. He had blind, hypocritical, judgmental, pharisaical, religious eyes. And the tension even got greater. You did not give me any water for my feet when I came into your house, which was a custom. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them up with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. 
You didn't put any oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you her many sins. And he didn't sweep anything under the rug, did he? I mean, what did Jesus say? Her many sins. Her shame was real. It was powerful. It was driving her to repentance. Jesus says her many sins have what? Have been forgiven. As her great love is shown. But Simon, whoever has been forgiven little, they love little. In the book of Matthew, Jesus makes a statement that to me speaks so powerfully to this story and the parable buried in the middle. And Jesus talks about his burden. He talks about his yoke. He says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, who? All of you who are weary and burdened. Come to me, only the people who've cleaned their lives up and look churchy. Nope. Come to me, all you people who have done more good things in your life than bad to outweigh so the cosmic scale tips in your favor. No. Come to me, all who have, what? Come to the end of themselves and decided to swallow their pride, to humble themselves and to run to the feet of the Savior. Come to me who? All you are weary and burdened by the choices you've made, by the weight of the world on your shoulders, by the things that you face with the uncertainty of the future, with the exhausting desire to control our own life and chart our own course. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. And Jesus says he's gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This woman was a worshiper and she worshiped like no other. Simon was just a churchy a person who wanted to look good, but didn't at all care about truly being spiritually good. So focused on the externals that he would judge you at the drop of a hat to make himself feel better. Alienating, driving wedges, keeping score. Jesus welcomed a woman who threw herself at his feet. Saw a woman for who she could be, not just who she was. Was moved with compassion because he understood how hard this world is to live in and how it sets itself up against having a right relationship with God. And this woman worshiped because worship is what we do in response to God that's beyond ritual and tradition. It's giving him our past, being fully present in this moment and trusting him with our future. It's being thankful for being forgiven much because it's a gift we didn't deserve. And I've asked Brian to come and and sing a song for us. And I want you just to sit and I want you to reflect, to examine the condition of your heart. Are you a worshiper like this woman? Or have you found yourself sliding toward the other end of the table? This is the time when if you allow your heart to be open, you allow yourself to hear from Jesus, he can change you and he can do it now. So just sit, listen, pray, open your heart, be in the moment, and then I'll come back up and we'll talk for another minute.
clear the stage and set the sound and lights ablaze. If that's the measure you must take to crush the idols, jerk the pews and all the decorations too. Until the congregation's few, then have revival. Tell your friends that this is where the party ends. Until you're broken for your sins, you can't be social. Then seek the Lord and wait for what He has in store. And know that great is your reward, so just be hopeful, 'cause you can sing all you want to. Yes, you can sing all you want to, and you can sing all you want to, and still get it wrong. Worship is more than a song. Take a break from all the plans that you have made, and sit at home alone and wait for God to whisper. Begging, please, to open up his mouth and speak, and pray for real upon your knees until they blister. Shine the light on every corner of your life until the pride and lust and lies are in the open. Read the word and put to test. The things you've heard until your heart and soul are stirred and rocked and broken. 'Cause you can sing all you want to. Yes, you can sing all you want to. You can sing all you want to and still get it wrong. Worship is more than a song. We must not worship something that's not even worth it. Clear the stage, move some space for the one who deserves it. Anything I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking. Is an idol. Anything that I give all my love is an idol. Oh, you can sing all you want to. Yes, you can sing all you want to. You can. Sing all you want to, still get it wrong. Worship is more than a song. Clear the stage and set the sound and lights ablaze. If that's the measure you must take to crush the idols.
So true worship is what happens beyond the ritual and tradition. It follows the example of this woman that Jesus saw, the woman who Jesus saw. She brought Jesus her past by literally leaving her past behind, running from who she used to be to who she wanted to be and knowing only one person could make that difference. She brought Jesus her present moment and allowed herself to humble herself in that moment, not caring what other people thought, but ran to Jesus and put herself at his feet. She offered Jesus her future by giving not just her what's next to Jesus, but even the perfume that she'd saved up for so long to buy, demonstrating that she trusted, that she was all in. Worship is what happens in our lives beyond the ritual and tradition that we fall into. What if God is as bored with complacent and lackadaisical worship as we can be? And it occurs to me that if I really mean it, I love Jesus. He's my savior, my Lord. He found me and rescued me. He freed me and gave me a purpose and a home. That if I really mean it, why wouldn't I say it? Why wouldn't I sing it? If I really mean it, why wouldn't I give it? Why wouldn't I show it? Because if I don't, there's nothing wrong with him. There's something wrong with me. And so we're just going to have an opportunity to offer our worship back to God through singing. And we're going to do something a little different, but man, it's so much fun and it's just so right. And that is that I've asked some friends that love to pray. People who, when I need prayer, I go to and ask to pray for me. People who meet before our early service every Sunday and pray for you. They're just gonna be here in the front. There's gonna be some on this side and there are gonna be some on this side. And we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing. And if you are bearing a burden today, we wanna pray with you. Because it makes so much difference. To not be alone, to know somebody hears you, to know somebody is lifting up the same things that are burdening your heart. It's what family does. It's what friends do. It's the way we get stronger and the way we grow in our faith. Some of you are bearing burdens for someone else. People who you desperately want to know the Lord, but have not yet made a profession of faith. Perhaps a kid that's making decisions that you know are destroying their lives and you can't do anything about. Maybe a relationship that's falling apart. Maybe a parent, maybe a friend that you bear burdens for other people and they weigh you down. Sometimes I speak from personal experience even more than the ones that are personal to us. Maybe you have something physical that's going on in your life or the life of someone you love and you need prayer. And I don't know anything better to do than to go to the Lord in prayer when we suffer, when we struggle, when we bear burdens, and also when we celebrate. And so in just a few minutes as we start singing, um, my friends and I, we're just going to be here in the front. And if you want, you just come on up and pray with us and we'll scoot off to the side. If not, just stand up and keep singing. It's between you and the Lord. And what I learned from first service is, after it was over, that there are a few people that just weren't 100% comfortable coming up here, and you're not going to be singled out in any way. But if you want somebody to just slip back to where you are and just kind of stand there and just pray with you and for you, just make eye contact with one of us and just kind of give us the, and we'll come. We're not going to come unless you ask, but if you want, we'll just come to you. But let's let these next few minutes be moments where we respond in true worship because Jesus deserves it and we are created for it. So friends, if I've asked you to come to the front and, and pray, please come and do that. Everybody else, let's stand right now and let's prepare to sing together.
So about three days ago, I was getting ready to leave the house and yeah, probably too much information, but we're friends and I was getting ready to jump in the shower and so Joyce stopped me. She was like, hey, stop. And you know, I didn't know there was danger I didn't know about or we were out of hot water or what. So of course I stopped and, and um, she said, you need to try a different shampoo today. And um, you may not know me well, but that's like, I promise you the last thing on my radar. And um, I asked why. And she said, well, your hair was a little poofy the other day. And so I thought maybe you should try a different shampoo. Now, my wife has my best interest at heart. She loves me. And she didn't want me to have a poofy top knot, whatever it was. I thought it was because I have the doors and the top off on my Jeep and I'm driving around without a hat. She thought it may be the shampoo. And so she was very specific and she's got a bunch in the, the shower. There's like, you know, certain conditions, weather conditions, maybe, I don't know, relative humidity, the temperature of the day, her mood. I mean, she's got enough shampoos to get it all covered. She was like, use the blue one. And um, she opened the top because it was one of those tops that, you know, were kind of fancy and she knew I would break it. And, and so I get in the shower and full disclosure, I totally forgot to use the new shampoo. I go to the same one every time, the same routine, the same place, as fast as I possibly can. It's about efficiency and cleanliness, not experience. And so I get out of the shower and when I'm dressed, I come out and she's like, well, how was it? And I said, how was what? And she goes, the new shampoo. And I fought for a second in a crisis of <laughs> conscience and whether I should, you know, tell the truth or not. And I had these thoughts run through my mind. First, I could just lie and go, oh, it was great. That's not a great thing to do. Or I could try to think like somebody who'd had just a great shampoo experience and describe it the way that they might describe it, even though I didn't have that same experience. And I didn't do that because I have absolutely no idea what that would even entail. So I just told her the truth. Didn't try it, don't get it, sorry, maybe next time. Maybe when we talk about worship, maybe when you see things that are going on, you experience things, um, you just don't get it. Sometimes we feel sort of compelled or forced to kind of act like we do. Trying to blend in, just kind of think like somebody who may have had a real worship experience or really be living this way and conform sort of to an image or culture that we're really not part of. And I just want to explain it to you real quick, how you can be on the inside of God's family, not the outside, how you can get it. And it goes back to the parable and we're almost done. So just listen carefully to this last part. When Jesus said two men owed a debt, one was a month and a half salary, one was a year and a half. Both were forgiven by the money lender. Who do you think loved more? The one who was forgiven more. We've all been forgiven from our death sentence that we were born with. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God every single one. So it has nothing to do with how many sins somebody's created or the ruler that you may have created through your own morality to gauge your own righteousness. One sin, a million sins, sinful, guilty, and destined for an eternity in hell. But the Bible tells us that even though the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And just like this woman who was done with her old life, who decided to run to the feet of Jesus with no fine print in her contract, no backup plan, no golden parachute, leaving her past throwing herself at his mercy in the present and trusting for her future. That's what we do. We confess our sin. We agree with him. We've sinned. We've fallen short. We've all done things, said things, thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to the Lord, all born sinful. We confess our sin. We simply tell God, I believe who Jesus is. I believe he's your son. I believe he was perfect. I believe he's God. He came to earth and lived a perfect life, never sinned, died a death he didn't deserve to take on my sin, a price I couldn't pay, rose again three days later and defeated sin, Satan, and death once and for all. You don't have to say it exactly like that, but it's true. So that by me believing in him, I don't have to pay this price. It's what allows him to receive us as we fall at his feet. And I want to live for you from now on. I don't want to live for me. 
confess, we believe, and we decide that we're going to be a follower of Christ. And you may not know how to do that, but we make it much harder than it really is because God has installed in you from the time you were conceived the ability to communicate with him. You just might not know it yet. And when you think thoughts that are addressed toward God, he hears those thoughts and receives those thoughts as prayers. And if you want to become part of his family, to be able to understand what this experience is all about, that goes far beyond feeling, but is grounded in reality, then maybe today's the day when you choose to become a follower of Christ too. You don't need anybody else to help you do it. It's between you and God. But if you want to talk to somebody about it, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Dan, myself, Lori, Joy, we're so excited. We love talking to people about things like this. So just grab us after service. We'll go to coffee. We'll hang out. Today could be the day that for you, everything changes. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I pray that we would be worshipers, humble and dependent like this woman. That we would see the people around us like Jesus sees people, not as the Pharisee saw them that we're done judging and labeling and alienating and driving wedges between us and the people who you came to die for, people you love. Help us see the way Jesus sees. Allow us to worship in the way we live, what we say, how we give to you, the things we do, because you deserve it. And Father, if we're not doing it, it's not your fault, it's ours. So forgive us for where we fail you. And let us today, through your strength and your help, begin to live a different way. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things, amen. Stand with me, please.